Well, hello. Salamat Sizbi. Zrasviti. Good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are. On behalf of the, uh, the British Kazakh Society, it is really a great pleasure to welcome you today to this uh, webinar titled Financial Services in Kazakhstan. A couple of uh, housekeeping points. This, uh, this um, webinar will be presented in English, but there is Russian translate interpretation available um, on laptops. It's very easy. There um, is down there a button which will select English or Russian language and uh, on phones though you may have to struggle a little bit because it's a slightly different system. Uh, the webinar will be recorded um, and available on the BKS uh, website after the event. So we have a great moderator and a very impressive panel today, all with exceptional backgrounds and experience in this sphere. Unfortunately, our first keynote, speak, keynote speaker, Mr. Yezhan Bertanov, Deputy Governor of the Bank of it, uh, the National Bank, has been called away at short notice to a government meeting. However, we are very, very pleased that the bank has arranged a speaker at short notice. So we're very delighted to welcome Mr. Ayan Artibekov, Director of the Financial or Development Department. Mr. Artibekov, please, a view from Kazakhstan. So, uh, thank you, David. Uh, hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the National Bank, I am pleased to welcome the participants of this webinar and why would like to thank the British Kazakh Society for organizing this event. Uh, as you know, this year, uh, Kazakhstan's... Uh, next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, as you know, this year, uh, Kazakhstan's economy experienced uh, the double, sh double shock due to the pandemic and the commodity prices drop. Uh, National Bank introduced urgent measures to prevent the transition of the external shock to the national economy. On March uh, 10th, National Bank raised the base rate to 12%. Uh, the decision was aimed to ensure the microeconomic stability. It also helped to reduce the pressure on the exchange rate to prevent the growth of inflation expectations and to mitigate the effect of the exchange rate exchange uh, path through into the prices. Later on April the 6th, 2020, given the risk of a significant decline in the economic activity, the National Bank lowered the base rate uh, up to 9.5%. On July 20th, uh, it was further reduced to 9%. These decisions were based on the this inflationary expectation given the external shocks to Kazakhstan's economy. However, the persistence of the uncertainty and increased pr probability of external risks limit the potential of lowering the base rate further. In October 2020, annual inflation amounted to 7.1%. The annual inflation is expected to accelerate further to 8% until the end of 2020. According to the baseline scenario, we lowered expectations for economic growth by the end of 2020. According to the forecast, GDP will decrease by 2.3% 2, 2 in 2020. Mm -hmm. In upcoming forecasting round, uh, November, December, we will update information forecasts and other macroeconomic indicators, depending on the evolving dynamics and the continuation of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, as a response to the uh, coronavirus outbreak, the government and the National Bank adopted a comprehensive package of actions to support the economic recovery. The measures amounted in April uh, for around 5.9 trillion tenge, which is ap approximately 13.7 billion US dollars. The MBK participation was for a total amount of 2.3 trillion tenge. Uh, the MBK's uh, measure include the increase the finance of uh, several uh, government programs, such as economy of simple things by the amount of 400 billion tenge, uh, employment roadmap by the amount of 700 billion tenge, uh, the concessional lending to the ent uh, enterprises. The amount was initially 
uh, six billion tenge, but then in October 2020 was raised by 200 uh, billion tenge. And the program called uh, Nurlajer 51020. Uh, those programs were aimed to help uh, the SMEs uh, to support them in the during the pandemic pandemic crisis and to stimulate the lending in the economy. Next slide, please. Uh, regarding the lending to the economy. In 2019, there was a change in the structure of lending. Banks mainly focused on consumer loans. The main factor for this was the high marginality of retail lending and high business uh, lending risks. Uh, for example, low level of equity of the companies uh, or liquidity, low return on investment and high debt burden. In 2020, despite the slowdown in lending activity, in retail and corporate sectors of the economy due to the state of emergency and uh, quarantine introduced in, in the country. The amount of loans issued to the economy is higher than in 2019. Uh, there is a significant increase in loans issued to SME uh, due to the implementation of government programs uh, to support the business, those programs that I have mentioned above. Under the program of concessional lending to enterprises, by November 30 uh, of this year, 1,371 business entities received 4,682 loans in total amount of 466.3 billion tenge, including 2,131 loans for uh, 112 uh, billion tenge that were financed by the repayable funds. On uh, about the uh, economy of simple things program, as of November, The 30th of this banks uh, excuse me. Uh, as of November the 30th of this year, banks received 1,317 applications for the amount of uh, 903 billion tenge, and uh, banks approved 512 projects worth uh, about 472 billion tenge, and issued 726 loans for the amount of uh, 466 billion tenge. Uh, according to this program, bor borrowers pay 6% uh, of the nominal rate and the difference of the market rate is subsidized by and a slight list. Uh, lending to the individuals. In addition to the growth of corporate lending, there is an increase in lending to individuals. Uh, the emphasis uh, was towards mortgage lending the main driver of mortgage lending in, in the, uh, is the launch of uh, mortgage programs of the National Bank named 7-2025. And then another program is uh, Baspana HIT. Under the program of, uh, named 7-2025, people can get a mortgage with a low interest rate of 7% with an initial payment uh, of 20% for a period of up to 25 years. Uh, in two and a half years, uh, more than 20,000 families bought their houses. Uh, loans were issued in the amount of 242 billion tenge. Uh, the Baspana HIT program is a market product with a remuneration rate equal to a base rate plus 1.75%. The mortgage loan is issued for up to 15 years. As of November the 30th of this year, under the Baspana HIT program, 39,000 uh, 102 loans were issued for the amount of 169.2 uh, billion tenge. Next slide, please. Uh, regarding the stock market, since uh, 2015, the stock market in Kazakhstan has seen significant growth. Uh, thus, the capitalization of the stock market has uh, doubled over the past five years, uh, from 6.7 trillion tenge to 13.5 trillion tenge. The number of investors increased by 25%. The main contribution to the development of the stock market was uh, made by the initial public offerings from the quasi-state companies. Uh, the first development of the stock market is, ex is expected through attracting a large number of uh, retail investors to the market, further bringing new companies to the IPO and introducing new technologies like uh, using uh, tools for remote ident identification of individuals, or developing a marketplace in the uh, stock market. Also, uh, 
the development of the stock market is uh, assumed to be done through entering uh, the market for uh, private pension asset managers. As you know, uh, this year, uh, our president uh, told that uh, people will be able to uh, use their uh, money that are, uh, uh, that are saved in the pension fund to uh, invest in the uh, private pension asset managers. Uh, next slide, please. Another part of the development of the stock market is uh, the development of the government securities market. Uh, in this uh, uh, case, the Ministry of Finance of the Republic of Kazakhstan, together with the NPK, are working to increase the volume of individual benchmark issues of government securities of the Rep Republic of Kazakhstan to minimum uh, levels required for inclusion in the GBI EM index. Uh, also, for professional market participants in the secondary market, together with the Kazakhstan Stock Exchange, incentive programs for market makers have been developed. These measures will contribute to an increase in the number of market makers for government securities of the Republic of Kazakhstan. From August the 10th of this year, the international settlement line between the Central Securities Depository and the International Depository Clearstream has been improved to the delivery versus payment type of short-term notes of the NBK and uh, government securities of the Minister of Finance. In conclusion, I would like to note that the financial services market in Kazakhstan shows positive dynamics uh, in the context of the pandemic. Moreover, the market change has pushed financial organizations to introduce new types of financial services and products and optimize their processes. We expect that in the coming years, we will see a dynamic growth of the financial sector. Thank you for your attention. Well, well thank you, uh, Ayan. That was a very, uh, very clear presentation with uh, very nice uh, slides. Our second view will be from the United Kingdom and it will be given by Mr. Wayne Evans, Managing Director for International Trade at the City UK. Wayne has a background as a diplomat involved in the trade, uh, trade issues and has been involved with the City UK since 2010. Over to you, Wayne. Wayne, are you there? Bear with us a moment here. We seem to have a uh, technical issue. If Wayne is not available, I'm going to suggest we go over to Rashid um, and continue from Oh, just a moment. Are we? Uh, no. Yes, here's Wayne. Right. Wayne, can you hear? Hello, uh, Wayne. Can you hear us? Yes, here we go. Okay. Over to you, Thank Wayne. You. Okay. We'll give Wayne uh, just a, a few more moments here to see if um, we can get that connection back. Otherwise, we'll turn around a little bit, go over to Rashid, and then come back to uh, to Wayne. Can you hear uh, Rashid? Ah, oh. Steve, thank you, Rashid, thank yes. you very much. Yeah, let's go over to. Uh, uh, I think we uh, 
Yes, uh, thank you. And I think we had a brilliant presentation from the National Bank. And uh, I'm sure we'll come back to Wayne Evans a bit later. Uh, we have a lineup of three speakers. And our first speaker today is uh, James. Uh, James Martin, CEO of AIFC Business Connect. And his presentation is about de-risking investment into Kazakhstan. James, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Rashid. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to the British Kazakh Society. Uh, it's a pleasure to see so many uh, familiar faces. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, please allow me to uh, simply share a screen here. Uh, hoping the technology works on. Can we see the screen, please? Excellent. I'll take that as a yes. You can see the screen. Can you see the screen, Rashid? Yes, we can see it well. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. So I want to say a, a few words about the Astana International Financial Center, because I think it's a key part of the uh, initiatives that we have set up within the Kazakhstan investment climate in order to enable uh, foreign investment to feel comfortable about accessing the great opportunities that we have, not only in Kazakhstan, but in the wider Central Asian region. So um, what I want to talk about basically is the role of the AFC in the ecosystem. So AFC was established um, as part of the constitutional law uh, in around 2015. And the purpose of this was to establish an international financial center an ecosystem which would be familiar to those investing to, in order to give them the comfort of fair treatment and accessibility to all the potential growth projects within the country. So our main goal in one of the constitutional uh, law is that we are to act as a, to create an ecosystem for the government in order to assist the government in attracting investment into the country. So as I look at it, it's basically that AIFC will enable you as an investor at, to utilize as a de-risking platform to enter into the marketplace. Briefly touching upon the AFC ecosystem, we are uh, headed up by the AFC Management Council, which is presided by His Excellency President Tukayev and co-chaired by His Excellency, the Prime Minister Mamen. Uh, and then this is to enable us to act with a single purpose and a window to access across the whole country for facilitation. And then what I will touch upon then is that we have several key entities which provide you with the comfort and de-risking uh, appetite for entering the, the country's investments. So what we have done is we've established the AIFC authority and that is the administration center in order to work with the government to provide the legislation and tax regime that you actually need for investment into the country. We have the fully international standard regulator, our AFSA regulator, to imply rules and regulations which are familiar from the best practices across the world. And then key element of de-risking investment is the establishment of the AIFC court and the AIFC arbitration center. Now, the, these are key elements for de-risking because they allow you to establish a presence within AIFC to operate and to raise capital and to use that capital to invest, understanding that we have a court based on UK principle law and that the judges are of the highest caliber of QCs, Queen Councillors from the United Kingdom. And then on top of that, we have the International Arbitration Center, which is a mediation and arbitration center to allow you opportunities to be able to sit and discuss as two parties and get full international uh, opportunity, which offers opportunity for people not only with the UK law, but also potentially in other jurisdictions. And it's worth mentioning that already now we're just slightly shy of 300 cases that have gone through the arbitration center. And what is actually important is to understand that the arbitration center and court, uh, once we have made a ruling in these entities, that they are fully enforceable within the jurisdiction of Kazakhstan, mainland, and also enforceable globally, which is a very, very key differentiator. 
So the idea is you'll establish a presence, a special purpose company or vehicle with an AFC jurisdiction. It could be a joint venture to give you, with an international party or a Kazakh party, fair and equal treatment. And then coming across the bottom quickly, we have the Astana International Exchange, where my esteemed colleague, the CEO, Mr. Tim Bennett, will shortly, will shortly uh, talk about how using that as a platform for public capital raising. And then we also offer the private capital raising through the other entities. We have the expat center to facilitate you entering the country in a, in a very smooth manner. We have my own entity, Business Connect, where I'm the chief executive officer, as well as being the chief investment officer for the AAFC. FinTech Green Finance Center offer you opportunities to invest in certain sectors, such as renewable sustainable growth, which is key for us, and in education on the BCPD. So when it comes into Business Connect, what I want to say is this is the further key tool for you to invest and de-risk your appetite and de-risk your project and investment into Kazakhstan. And it's based on three key elements. Understanding that the source of projects must be real. It is our role to find real bankable projects and opportunities for growth for you to invest in. So we work closely with entities such as Kazakh Invest where we sit together to ensure that the projects which they bring forward also meet the full international standards with regards to diligence, financial, non-financial, and feasibility, et cetera. And then we'll also work with other national companies and funds to ensure that real projects are seeking opportunity for investment. And once these projects have been verified that they are real, we then look to a further element of de-risking, which is what we're calling the structuring projects. So we will work with the government co-investment funds to make sure that they will be willing to put some skin in the game, which will give you a further comfort layer of government investment into a project. And then if potential is there, we then talk to our partners in the supranational IFI industry, such as EBRD, ADB, AIIB, to see if they would be further willing to invest in a project. So by the time that we come and speak to you as a potential investor, we would have verified a project, we would have looked for domestic co-investment and potentially international co-investment. And then we will sit with the buy side in our third part, the go-to market, to understand exactly what are your investment needs? What are your mandates when raising capital and opportunities? And then my team has a significant deal pipeline where we can sit and discuss which sectors, which sort of shape or format you're looking for and how we can help. But what is key is the bottom part. What I want you to understand and take away is it is de-risking through law and it is de-risking through all these different elements, but we are not just a center for financial services. We are a center for raising finance. So we have key areas such as agriculture, mining, energy, and finance. These are just some of the areas. We also have tourism where the key takeaway is that you can come through AFC to gain of some benefits and tax benefits, but you can also still avail of the full benefits and subsidy programs that are offered by the ministries on shore. So what is it all about? Well, in summary, it's all about the English common law to help you uh, de-risk. It's about world-class standard regulations so you feel comfortable in the way you do business. We have 0% of corporate tax for the operations within the AFC until 2066. We will help you with your labor and visa and you will feel comfortable with a financial and business ecosystem. So then what we do look to help, which I'm sure uh, my colleagues will talk about shortly, but it's all about giving you a flexible currency regime. It's having structured projects that will enable you to invest in different currencies and raise capital in different currencies. Co-investments, again, about bankable projects, real projects with real co-investment, and then finally, it's also talking about how we can wrap these up in other investment subsidies onshore as well, such as private public partnerships. So we access not only for the Kazakhstan, but it will give you this opportunity to be in a safe ecosystem, invest in the wider region, about real bankable in Kazakh and Belt and Road bankable projects, and then access, especially through our Astana International Exchange, to the state privatization of enterprises. So thank you very much, Rashid, for this opportunity and to the British Kazakh Society, and I look forward for any potential questions. Thank you. James, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
very very interesting presentation. And I think de risking is probably the key word now when everyone is pretty scared to risk anywhere, even including their home countries. So uh, I would suggest that we move to the next speaker, Tim Bennett, who is the CEO of Astana International Exchange. And uh, his presentation is Astana International Exchange Prospects for Development in the Uncertain Economic Environment. Tim, over to you, please. Yeah, good morning or afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar. I'll uh, take you through a bit about ourselves, AIX, what we've achieved over the last couple of years and how we see the investment prospects going forward for the public capital markets in Kazakhstan. So firstly, um, an overview of um, AIX. We are a fully functioning, globally connected exchange. Uh, we were established uh, a little over two years ago. We traded our first equity IPO, Kazadamprom. And subsequent to that time, we have built an ecosystem that you would expect of any uh, well-managed, well-regulated emerging market exchange. Um, we have a group of brokers, Kazakh, Russian and international, which provide connectivity uh, to a broad range of investors, institutional fund managers uh, around the world, uh, institutions in Kazakhstan, and also uh, institution uh, retail investors in Kazakhstan. Importantly, we've established links with um, the major global CSDs and custodians so that uh, investors, particularly offshore investors, uh, can hold their securities uh, with the custodian of their choice. As James alluded to, our regulation, regulatory environment is very much based on the principles of uh, common law. Uh, and within that, our regulator, the Astana Financial Services Authority, has set up a principles-based mm -hmm. regulatory environment and uh, AIX ourselves regulate uh, issuers and brokers on behalf of uh, AFSA, a self-regulating organization as it's known in the industry. It's a relatively uh, common uh, regulatory environment, uh, which assists both with uh, our broker connectivity, they understand how they need to connect and how we're gonna regulate them, but also for our issuers, uh, particularly uh, the larger issuers who have historically uh, been uh, issuing securities in the fixed income space, certainly uh, euro bonds and in equities uh, on the London market. Our infrastructure is based around the NASDAQ trading engine, a, an emerging markets uh, platform for uh, our CSD and uh, common connections to uh, both Reuters and uh, Bloomberg. And we've got a, both a combination of an international and Kazakh team uh, and we can support the broad range of issuance uh, from debt, uh, equity, convertibles. Uh, we settle in five currencies and we've got a team who can support um, some of the more common features of the Kazakh capital markets, including book building. The obvious question is, you know, why would you establish uh, a second exchange in Kazakhstan? And our colleague from the National Bank alluded to some of the work that CASA is doing in the fixed income market. There are, there are two reasons for doing that. Uh, one is CASA's uh, historic focus and continued focus has been around uh, the fixed income market, uh, in particular MBK and, and uh, the Republic of Kazakhstan securities. Uh, and then secondly, uh, the importance of the capital market to Kazakhstan is the introduction of uh, offshore capital. And um, the way to do that is to build an ecosystem of foreign brokers and provide access to institutional investors. And that's something that, as I said, AOX has focused on. Our first listing in uh, equity listing, it was in November two years ago, and uh, that was Kazadamprom, uh, the world's largest uh, uranium producer and uh, a flagship company in Kazakhstan. Uh, Samrok Kazina, the sovereign wealth fund, sold down 25% uh, through that offering, uh, sorry, 15% through that offering, and has made a couple of secondary offerings on the market through AIX, uh, including one this year. Another transaction this year was uh, the cross-listing of KSL, which is listed in London. Uh, it's important for us to provide investment opportunities for local as well as international investors. And um, the ease of trading on AIX for local investors means that it's attractive for Kazakh businesses 
have historically uh, listed in London, had very limited liquidity, as in the case of KSL, to start to broaden their investor base, uh, to provide more liquidity uh, in the stock and, and therefore a much more appropriate valuation. Uh, Ferro Alloy is a uh, junior mining business uh, focused uh, on Valadium. Uh, it's again uh, been listed in London historically, uh, has been seeking to raise additional capital, uh, listed on AIX uh, to support that capital raising process. And then finally, uh, for those of you who are in the UK, uh, and in particular in London, will be familiar with Caspi.kz. Um, uh, it has it was the second largest IPO in uh, Europe this year, uh, placed largely in London, uh, but gives uh, a sense of the appetite for high growth uh, businesses in Central Asia. Uh, the stock uh, was, uh, the book build was done at a range between 28 and $33 per GDR, uh, listed at 40 and is now trading towards uh, above $50 a share. So we know there's uh, certainly investor appetite for Kazakh businesses, uh, and we have the platform uh, that can support that. We uh, had a large number of fixed income issuers issues this year, as you'd expect, uh, given the economic environment as well. And again, we see uh, particularly the larger Kazakh businesses uh, looking to use the bond market as opposed to the banking system uh, to uh, improve their balance sheets uh, during the pandemic. Just a couple of comments um, on Kazakhstan's COVID-19 response. Um, you know, this is a, the pandemic has, uh, to, to be, say the least, caught most countries by surprise in terms of uh, the strain on the health system and uh, the uh, strain on the economy. And I have to be fair to say that Kazakhstan on both counts has uh, done extremely well uh, given the state of development of, of the uh, healthcare system. Uh, there was a first wave of COVID uh, from late March through the beginning of May, uh, with almost a total lockdown across the country. And then a second wave, uh, which happened towards the end of summer uh, through August. And of course, we're starting to see cases increase at the moment. Um, but given, as I say, given the state of the healthcare system has been very well managed by, uh, by the government authorities. And in these sorts of countries, clearly a need to ensure that we have uh, behavioural change in order to uh, stop the spread of the disease. And we would hope that coming out of the second lockdown, we're starting to see some of that. And uh, as I said, uh, the uh, case numbers, while uh, increasing somewhat, are certainly not what you're seeing in some countries of Europe that are experiencing their second wave coming into winter. Um, there was a swift economic response as was covered by the National Bank. Um, to put this in context, uh, most developing countries economic responses have been in the range of uh, 7 to 10 percent of GDP. Uh, Kazakhstan, given its strong fiscal position, uh, has announced uh, investments of up to 15 percent of GDP. And uh, getting that into the hands of individuals was very swift. Um, there was a, a one-off grants of uh, 42,500 tinge to individuals who are unable to work, and that was facilitated through the banking system uh, within days of it being announced by the government. There was a number of uh, different iterations of the economic recovery plan that uh, was announced in the middle of the year, um, being backed up by uh, a set of principles, which I'll go through shortly uh, by President Tokayev in September, uh, and is starting to be rolled out, including the establishment or uh, re-establishment of an economic development and strategy agency uh, headed by Governor Kalan Betov, uh, the uh, current governor of the AIFC. The impact on the capital markets uh, has been not surprisingly similar to what we've seen in other parts of the world. Um, we've seen at the, in the beginning of the uh, lockdown, a sharp pullback in global equity markets, uh, not surprisingly, uh, Samuel Kazina has delayed the privatisation program as a result to next year or 2022. Um, in particular, the largest IPO uh, that is planned as part of that program, uh, Cosminogas, uh, was delayed uh, largely because at that point in time, uh, the oil price was uh, trending close to zero. We've seen an increase in transaction volume in AIX, uh, particularly over summer. Um, a lot of interest in uh, frontier and emerging markets during that time frame, 
Uh, we saw some of that and also interest from retail investors as we've seen across the world. We've seen, as you'd expect, uh, and I mentioned before, renewed levels of debt issuance. And I'd say, particularly over the last uh, one to two months, uh, an interest in equity capital raising in the back end of 2021, uh, 2022. Importantly, I think, uh, and it's my view rather than a, a perspective from uh, an institution in, in uh, Kazakhstan is, uh, there's a realisation that there's a continued need for offshore capital to fund economic growth. Uh, and the statement from President Tokayev in the, uh, in the middle of the slide that the all super cycle is over uh, typifies uh, the government's response. Uh, there is a recognition that um, you can't uh, continue to develop the economy based around oil and gas, uh, which is currently around a third of GDP. Uh, and the uh, oil price in May was a stark reminder of that. So there's a renewed focus on diversifying uh, the investment sources uh, to fund uh, the economic recovery, uh, and in particular, a focus on offshore investment. And clearly, uh, AIX and uh, AIFC more broadly, uh, and as you heard from James, Business Connect, are integral parts in uh, facilitating uh, the flow of uh, offshore capital into Kazakhstan. How do we see the outlook specifically uh, for AIX? Um, in the fixed income space, um, like a lot of governments around the world, uh, in fact, all governments around the world, uh, there's uh, large government deficits, uh, which will need to be funded by debt. Um, Kazakh government uh, undertook a euro bond issue in rubles uh, a couple of months ago and would expect uh, continued euro bond issuance in 2021 and 22 uh, to fund the government deficit. Local currency, uh, as uh, MBK uh, talked about at the beginning of this uh, webinar, uh, looking to facilitate uh, offshore investment into uh, taking a denominated sovereign bond market uh, through a link with Bloomberg. In the private sector, um, we have uh, listed a number of fixed income issues by smaller issuers, uh, US dollars uh, that are relatively high yield, reflecting the nature of their businesses and their inability to fund those businesses through the banking sector. Uh, and we're starting to see uh, larger issuers look to a US dollar or Euro, Euro dollar uh, fixed income issuance as well as they look to shore up their balance sheets uh, for uh, the recovery in 2021. On the equity space, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the privatisation programme uh, has been uh, deferred till next year, or most likely in my view, 2022. Um, however, the government announced at the end of October, the uh, shift in the role of Samra Cuisina away from uh, effectively an endowment fund for the country that was funding uh, partly the government, but partly uh, education towards a more traditional uh, sovereign wealth fund, uh, a portfolio investor, if you like, uh, modeled on some of the largest sovereign wealth funds in Asia. Uh, and as part of those changes, uh, the uh, Samrook announced that it would sell down up to 49% of uh, its uh, portfolio companies. Uh, this is a change from up to 25% uh, that they've historically indicated. So we do see some potential for secondary offerings uh, of those already listed Samrock Cuisine and portfolio companies next year, uh, given the current state of the equity markets. In the private sector, uh, again, would see expect to see some secondary offerings. Uh, valuations are relatively attractive at the moment. Uh, and uh, a number of the listed companies in Kazakhstan have large shareholders uh, you'd expect to be looking to diversify their portfolios. On the IPO side, um, as I said, there's some initial signs of interest. Um, AIX has been operational, as I said, for two years. Um, in most markets, you'd see an IPO cycle in the three to five year time frame. So we're getting to that point where um, companies understand the benefits of listing. Uh, we have the investor base available to support that. So perhaps at the end Sorry, of the Tim, one minute, yeah. Sorry, we are a bit short of time now. One minute, yeah. And uh, finally, uh, next year, very much a focus for us on the junior mining sector. Uh, we have um, developed a portal uh, which will launch in January um, based on some research done by SRK, and we have a pipeline of over 60 
projects or companies that are looking to raise uh, capital in the early stages of mining development. And not surprisingly, uh, the, in the industries that you would expect, uh, 45 gold projects uh, often combined with copper, uh, and interestingly, uh, quite a number of projects in battery metals which are in high demand. So we'd expect to see some listings uh, in that space uh, next year. So just to briefly summarize, um, investor interest remains strong. Uh, AX has built a platform over the last couple of years which can support uh, both equity and debt issuance uh, to global investors. Uh, so we look forward to working uh, with some of you to um, make that happen in 2021. Thank you very much. Tim, thank you. Thank you very much. Very informative. And I, I've been involved, as you know, in uh, this uh, drafting listing rule for junior mining companies. And I'm, I'm glad it's coming on stream now and hopefully there will be listings uh, next year. So thank you very much for that. And portal, I think, is a very good idea where everyone can check up up to speed what, what's going on, basically. So uh, if you don't mind, uh, let me introduce our next speaker. And our next speaker is Ayuna Nichaeva, who is the head of Europe primary markets at the London Stock Exchange. Uh, Ayuna is also chair of the Eurasia Market Advisory Group at the City UK. Uh, Ayuna's presentation today is on successful cooperation between UK and Kazakhstan. Ayuna, please. Thank you very much, Rashid, and thank you to uh, uh, to BKS for having me uh, on this at uh, this important event. Um, I will be as succinct and, and, and concise as I can given the time constraints. So, uh, let me um, uh, create uh, some background uh, um, color uh, picture for you and set the scene for for what's been happening in the UK and the London as an international financial center. And then I will move on uh, to some of the great um, uh, UK Kazakh uh, success stories that uh, Tim Bennett actually has already alluded to uh, in his previous presentation. So next slide, please. Uh, first of all, uh, it was interesting to see that in uh, March um, uh, uh, 2020, earlier this year, we saw, of course, a uh, a big and sudden decline in capital markets across the board globally in Europe as well and in London. But what was actually very interesting is that in the uh, following several weeks, uh, the markets have recovered pretty quickly as companies started tapping into the uh, pools of capital to really uh, uh, raise um, equity and debt um, to support their balance sheet and to ensure that their businesses continue to grow. So uh, interestingly, now that we are almost at the year end, we see that this year has been one of the most active in terms of uh, capital raising activity in London. So 32.7 billion um, uh, sterling uh, has been raised in London through IPOs and follow on issuances. Um, uh, by 30th of September. And that even doesn't even include all of the fantastic IPOs that we have seen in October and November. Um, and as you can see on this chart, London was ahead uh, all of the uh, big, Rush, uh, big uh, European exchanges um, uh, at this, uh, in the, during this period of time. One important thing I wanted to mention is that, um, uh, interestingly, uh, the year has been also very successful for the Shanghai London Stock Connect where we saw two major transactions by China Pacific Insurance and China Yangtze Power, um, who raised uh, combined over three, uh, over three um, uh, uh, billion US, uh, uh, three billion actually sterling um, uh, through this channel. And of course, we saw uh, massive uh, technology IPOs, including the hard group holdings from the UK. Um, next one, please. Um, and then, uh, interestingly, uh, the, the, this activity is not only uh, a, repre a representative of the, of the capital issues in Europe, it's actually, it actually worth seeing how it all compares on the global scene compared to the US, Asian um, uh, exchanges. And you can see that, uh, for example, if we look back to 2019, 30% of all of the global cross-border IPOs actually happened in London and three out of, out of five uh, largest um, IPOs in 2019 globally uh, uh, 
war, uh, actually in London War International. So that's a very important point. And that actually plays into the next arguments that I'm going to make about the importance of international cooperation and partnership with, with other exchanges that we do um, are here um, in London. Next slide, please. So uh, another, another slide setting the scene, you can see uh, some of the biggest names that, um, uh, that are listed and traded from the CIS space uh, on the London Stock Exchange. I have been covering this area for over 10 years now, and I'm really delighted to see that this trend continues. Of course, all of the latest IPOs from, uh, from Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan Prom, KSL, um, Kaspi KZ um, are there, but also, of course, um, big um, Russian community, but also some of the other Central Asian uh, markets. Just to touch on, for example, um, a really great activity uh, that we see out of Uzbekistan that's happening um, uh, in the debt space. But um, I, will, I might touch on this uh, in, a separate, um, uh, in a separate event. Today, we're focusing on Kazakhstan. So uh, if, you, if you show us the next slide, um, some just to do a little bit of a deep dive. Uh, Kazakhstan Prom was, of course, a very important transaction for us because we worked very closely with IIX to ensure that it was all a success. It was, uh, as Tim mentioned, the first IPO uh, on IIX, and it was important for all of us for it to be uh, for it to be uh, uh, successful and, and to go and to go uh, really smoothly. And what's important about this as well was that it was from a very interesting space. It was uranium, so. So um, uh, we wanted to ensure that we work together to attract the best possible set of investors, not just the emerging market investors, but also the uh, sectoral investors, investors from Europe, UK, US. Um, and it was really great to see um, that not only uh, the IPO was successful, but also the two subsequent follow-on issuances by uh, the, ma uh, the majority shareholder, Samuel Kazina. If you show the next slide, um, and now we're coming to the, uh, the, I think, one of the biggest success stories out of Kazakhstan. It's Kaspi KZ. It was the largest cross-border technology IPO on London Stock Exchange so far this year. It was also the second largest technology IPO overall after the Hard Group. Uh, the money raised was over 1 billion US, uh, US dollars, if you include the green shoe. The capitalization today is over 10, 10 billion US dollars. Um, and having placed at 6.5, 6.7 billion, you can see um, how fast the, the company has grown. From the LSG perspective, what was really uh, interesting is, is uh, to see the liquidity. Because um, the success of a, of a listing or an IPO is not just the type of investors, it's not just the valuation, but also what's, happen what's happening in the aftermarket. And I'm really delighted to say that Caspi was the most liquid stock on the London Stock Exchange on the first day of trading on the 15th of October. It was ahead, HSB, ahead of HSBC, any of the other big FTSE, FTSE 100 um, uh, companies. It was really remarkable to see uh, how much interest there was in actually trading this, uh, this security. So uh, we're really hoping that we will, uh, that uh, Caspi will continue trading successfully. And it's also a really fantastic story about the innovation that's coming in from Kazakhstan. It's an e-commerce, super app, financial technology business. And uh, the, the stuff that they're doing is pretty exciting. I'm really delighted that they chose, instead of going anywhere else, they chose to list on the local market, on the domestic market, and, and the London Stock Exchange. Next slide, please. Another very important point is uh, uh, we talk to all of our issues about ESG, environmental social governance. And just very quickly, sustainability is at the, at the heart of everything that we do. Uh, London Stock Exchange has been named this year um, the Green Exchange of the Year. That's very exciting for us. But it's not just what we do, but actually how we provide guidance to the issues uh, that are on our markets uh, about, about all of the important aspects of environmental, social and governance. And the final slide, please. And one of the biggest innovation that we launched uh, recently was the Green Economy Mark. We award this mark to the companies that derive over 50% of its revenues from the business activities uh, that are classified as green according to the FTSE Russell Green Revenue Taxonomy. And FTSE Russell is part of um, London Stock Exchange Group. 
And this is very important because we also provide an incentive for companies to become compliant and to move towards more sustainable and green revenue solutions so that they can qualify for this mark and attract a broader and, and more uh, diversified um, uh, set of investors. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. And i um, uh, really looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ayun. I think that was very, very good overview of cooperation. And I think uh, we now have uh, speaker back, Wayne Evans, who is a uh, managing director at the International Trade and Investment, the City UK. And I think his presentation will uh, nicely kind of cover view from the UK. And I think it's very timely because we already heard all the speakers. And now we, we have a last speaker, Wayne Evans. Wayne, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Rashid, and my apologies again for my broadband dropping out at the, at the key moment. Um, I will keep my remarks short, so I'm looking forward to Q&A well, uh, very much, and I, I very much appreciate the previous speakers' comments as well. Okay, um, I think before I was cut off, I was mentioning the strengths and the benefits of a, of a cluster environment, and I've visited many international centres around the world, and there's nothing worse than... Uh, spending a 30 minute meeting uh, and then having to get in a taxi for another hour for another 30 minute meeting and then get in a taxi for another hour for another 30 minute meeting. So, so and I think that's one of the beauties of the Astana International Financial Centre is that you've got a lot of, a lot of the, the, the key people all under one roof. So I'm very pleased with the way that the, the AIC has, has developed. A key part of the financial and professional systems, uh, related professional system here in the UK, is that we have a very strong regulatory and legal system which underpins the work of our industry. We believe getting the legal and regulatory framework is critical and we often work with other international partners in, to support them as they develop their own uh, frameworks. Effective and transparent financial and legal systems are essential to attract investment and to develop trade with other markets. And we're very pleased at the steps that Kazakhstan has taken in this area and at the City UK we're very pleased and proud of the links we have helped to facilitate between UK and Kazakhstan businesses, uh, officials and regulators. And we've seen some of those, some of those uh, uh, links in, in, in the work of the previous speakers. We've worked closely with the AISC businesses and the Kazakhstan government to support sustainable and economic growth in, in Kazakhstan. And it's encouraging to see the establishment of the and it's encouraging to see in the establishment of the ASA that represents a significant achievement in, for Kazakhstan's ability to offer international investors confidence in its economic development. It is important for the delivery of the country's extensive privatisation and economic diversification progress process. Since 2017, the City UK and AIC have partnered on a number of projects including two to develop the AIC's governance framework. I was pleased to co-chair with Professor Alexander van der Put, a working group made up jointly of UK and Kazakhstan governance experts, which produced some recommendations on principles of corporate governance for the AIC. And I now understand that these have been improved by the AIC board. So these are very good steps being taken by the government of Kazakhstan and the AIC. We've also worked at the, with colleagues in the AIC to develop uh, Kazakhstan's Islamic framework sector. And the chair of the City UK's Islamic Finance Group, a recognized expert in, in the field of international uh, Islamic finance, Stella Cox, recently became a member of the Astana International Financial Center's Advisory Council on Islamic Finance. So that's another very positive step for financial inclusion. This year, we are working with the AIC to produce an ambitious, amb um, ambitious agenda on green finance with support from the British Embassy in North Sultan. We have set up a working group of green finance experts to share insights and best practice on green finance and make recommendations on the AIC green finance strategy. As previous speakers have mentioned, sustainable finance is going to be the, a major part of the work that is being done internationally in global financial markets. Tim referred earlier to the, the, the reliance on oil and gas has to be, uh, cannot be relied upon, and he's quite right. And, and Kazakhstan's not the only country doing this. At the City UK, we've, got, we've had inquiries from Saudi Arabia and from Brunei, huge oil and gas producers. 
um, who are trying to diversify their economy and, and re reduce their reliance on, on oil and gas products. So the steps being taken in Kazakhstan must be commended too. Look into the future. I know that Kazakhstan authorities are eager to continue to progress on the privatization agenda. And although Tim's mentioned it may be delayed, it's not going to be stopped. There is significant per potential for us to work together for mutual benefit here. International investors <coughs> based in the UK are eager to gain access to <coughs> high yield opportunities. And London provides a strong platform for investment into Kazakhstan. So there's much interest in the market in Kazakhstan. I hope that UK and Kazakhstan financial and related professional services can continue to exchange insights and best practices for the benefits of both countries. The ties that we have built are even more important now that the impact of COVID-19 is being felt on the global economy. We now need greater efforts to work together, strengthen ties and share experiences and best practice so that we can recover from this crisis. I hope that our work with Kazakhstan stakeholders, including our most recent work on green finance, will help to further this goal. Finally, I will say again how much we in the UK welcome the growing ties between the UK and Kazakhstan. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak. And again, my apologies to all participants for the uh, technology problems. Thank you. Wayne, thank you very much. I think that was a very, very good final presentation today. Uh, we have five, only five minutes left. So I, I suggest we, we take... Uh, uh, we take the questions and they are in Q&A section. Uh, I think the first question is for, for our speaker from, uh, is he still with us? Uh, sorry, sorry, we'll have to skip this one. Uh, I think we have actually even better questions there for the whole panel. And the question is from anonymous uh, attendee. Can the panel share some light on the UK and Kazakhstan pandemic recovery? what's the role of the financial services in supporting the recovery? So I, I wonder who wants to, to be first to, to answer that. Ayuna, please. Rashida, um, uh, I'd love to take, take on this um, uh, question because I already, I think, touched on uh, some of the things that the financial services um, uh, have done for the recovery, for, for helping the recovery after the pandemic um, uh, during this year. One of the things is, of course, providing a source of capital to support the businesses. It has become crucially important for companies to, uh, to uh, tap into the existing investor pool uh, to really um, um, uh, prop up their balance sheet, but also to continue developing. So that was one, uh, one very important point. Uh, the second important, important point is uh, the public markets, the capital markets also uh, provide a number of instruments. So this year, over 3 billion has been raised uh, through COVID-19 bonds. So international organizations such as um, IFC, uh, uh, Latin American Development Bank, have, uh, have specifically uh, placed uh, fixed income instruments uh, to, uh, uh, to battle the um, aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's really important. The municipalities, the cities also place um, uh, uh, raise uh, fixed income capital to, uh, to help uh, their communities to, um, uh, to recover. Um, and the last point I wanted to make is interesting to see, I mean, in the UK now you have the vaccine uh, approved, that's a really, uh, that's a really big prop up to, uh, to the markets. And of course, uh, one, one of the, um, we talk about V-shaped recovery, um, but one of the types of recovery that some uh, economists are talking about is K-shaped recovery. So the stock markets are going up. The real economy is not yet. So it will be interesting to see for us how they will align uh, as the real economy continues in the UK uh, to recover in the UK or in Kazakhstan. But the stock markets are continuing to, to be pretty resilient. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was uh, obviously view from, from the UK. So I wonder whether anyone from uh, well, any other, yes, James. Yeah, James, please over to you. I mean, uh, on top of Ayuna's excellent comments about the capital markets, uh, if I talk a little bit more about what we've been doing with Kazakhstan, but together with some of the other financial centers, for instance, we are just uh, about to publish a report we've done on SME markets, which I think is very, very key for us, especially in Kazakhstan. I mean, 
Tim mentioned not only the fact of the strong macroeconomic uh, uh, situation that we're blessed to find ourselves in, but the, the efficiency of getting the money to the SMEs and to the people that actually need it is and was key. So for us, I mean, I think the OECD average for uh, the OECD market is around 65% of the, um, the GDP contribution from SMEs. I mean, here in Kazakhstan, we're operating around 28%. So this is a fundamental key for us to be able to offer facilitation of the keeping the economy flowing. Now, that could be through digital products, digital banking, obviously, of the success of Caspi itself. It is the true digital banking. It is us developing more digital and e-commerce facilities here in our FinTech lab and FinTech hub that we're doing in the AIFC. Um, and then it's also a case of understanding that governments now have to rightfully focus on healthcare on, uh, on these key issues so that we have to be able to offer private and public capital raising facilities so that the government can perhaps co-invest and spread their investments as well as supporting through PPP. So I think recovery will be gratefully pushed, uh, greatly pushed through PPP structures as well, where we need to show the right uh, ecosystems in place. Thank you, thank you. Uh, James, from my side, I can probably confirm that in Kazakhstan, we see increasing number of potential investors who seek uh, investment. And there will be announcement hopefully next week at the at Kazakhstan UK Intergovernmental uh, Forum about some of the projects and actually in the area of PPP where, where actually my firm and myself were, were involved. So I, I quite agree with you. And uh, I think we have only a couple of minutes left. So Wayne, I think you, you raised a hand. So Wayne, Wayne Evans, right? Please, Wayne. Uh, Just Wayne, briefly I to add on, on, the, on the comments from you got me now just briefly to add on the comments from james and iona which i totally endorse yeah uh yes the uh the the aifc and the city uk are members of the world alliance of, uh, international financial centers and th th that is a topic that the world alliance is is looking at i think that may be the report that james referenced as well uh so yeah, it is an issue that's been looking at globally um, on how we can work together and even if it's just a matter of, uh, of smoothing out and taking out regulation just to add a bit on the UK, um, we're very much aware of that. The City UK has done a lot of work on the uh, on the cost of recapitalisation, um, and that can be accessed through our website at the City UK. We have made some recommendations to the British government uh, on how much sums are involved and, and, and where we see the way ahead. The British government has some schemes in place to support SMEs, specifically those that are not comfortable about going to the major exchanges because of their size or but something they haven't done in the past. So the government has put in place some uh, schemes to, to help SMEs, and that has been underpinned by the UK banking system. So the, the, the financial services are playing a role in the, in the recovery in the UK. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. I think that was very, very good comprehensive answer from, uh, from you. Uh, so I think we, we're about to finish, but before we go, before we all go, I want to give a floor to David Skills who had a couple of announcements on behalf of British Catholic Society. Thank you very much to all speakers today. I think we had a very, very good panel discussion on, on various matters with regards to financial services in both countries. David, over to you, please. Thank you, uh, Rashid, uh, very much in, indeed. Um, the two items I, I need to, or two issues need to bring up here. Uh, first of all, of course, is to thank uh, um, everyone um, involved, our panel, uh, Ayan, Wayne, Rashid, James, Tim and Ayuna for their uh, participation, very positive uh, participation. Uh, you, the audience, and also the two people that we uh, we don't see here, Jeantois behind the scenes, uh, pulling the uh, Zoom strings, and uh, Yelena interpreting in, uh, in London. Um, so finally, I'll mention the... the uh, British Kazakh Society uh, events, which are, are coming up, the Society uh, uh, webinar events. Uh, next week, we have Mr. Grigory Marchenko, who will be having a conversation on December the 10th, which should be uh, uh, very uh, interesting to, to all. And for the uh, business issues, um, next year, we start in, uh, in uh, 2021 on January the 27th with an agribusiness, which will be in conjunction with the uh, DIT. 
um, mining in February, again with the DIT, oil and gas and renewables in March, and perhaps uh, another financial services um, in April. So with that, I encourage you to uh, look at our website and we look forward to seeing you all as members at the next event. Thank you very much indeed.